I V M. Hey everybody, welcome to another amazing week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money, for supporting the network. Guys, you should definitely check out some of the content that we're doing recently, which is somewhat COVID related. Bhavan's been doing an awesome job on the Pragati Podcast. All Things Policy has also got a tremendous number of really, really great episodes about what's going on and the impact. We talk about this stuff on Cyrus Says, especially in the Cock and Bull episodes, on advertising instead. Varun's had a couple of episodes where he's spoken about the impact of this as a Karthik on the Filter Coffee podcast. And I mean, like, you know, across the network, definitely do check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy yourself. And with that, let's get you to your show. World Wide Web. As a kid, when I tried imagining this word, I thought of the internet to be like this giant net that encompasses everything and everyone and ties them all together. Until I grew up, and realize the disparities in this idea of a united world and about spaces that are out of reach for the net as well as people i read about marginality as an adult and that left me hanging but what do we really understand from the idea of a margin well who decides what becomes a margin one of the most common sensibly misconstrued quote and quote marginal spaces are the ones that belong to indigenous communities often portrayed as a monolith and almost reduced to a stereotype the understanding of an indigenous community in mainstream culture is heavily skewed thanks to the world wide web i came across a narrative that intrigued me a method of telling stories of real people that belong to six different tribes amongst the hundreds that exist in the country by following them into their worlds and i have the fortune to host the author of this literary fiction today on litnama joining me right after the short break is a journalist who attempts to not bring this margin to the center but to make the margin a place of reality the author of white as milk and rice published by pen in india nidhi dugar kandani hi i am satyajit hi i am racheta We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rana, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app or website or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Lit Nama. Um, I'm amazed because this is the first time like I've had somebody reach out to me, which has seemed like it's a personal achievement. And when you uh, texted me about your book, I was like, okay, wait a minute. Am I like, is this even happening? Because I had read the scroll article that came out about your book, and I think this is one of the victories of starting Lit Nama for me. So, welcome to the show. Oh wow that's that's so good work honestly uh hi lakshmi um thank you i i i am i have heard a couple of your podcasts before so i knew um i i would love to i knew i would want to chat with you some day so uh, when my marketing agent suggested that we do this i thought why not and um, yeah this this is this is very exciting and i'm absolutely looking forward to doing this This is so much fun. So, is this like the first podcast you've ever been on, or have you done some audio interviews before? Um, uh, I have. In fact, I've been on the other side, and I have interviewed a couple of people, and um, I yeah, have done right. a. Uh, I have done a podcast for uh, on Spotify. I think it was with a couple of um, um, uh, it was I think with a publication or two. but that's about it so yes this is a this is one of those uh, you know a proper interview this is one of my first experiences yes oh my god i am so glad <laughs> because okay there are so many things i need to talk about uh, firstly that this is your second book that i read that you that you were so kind to send to me and um actually i was supposed to read it over a week because i have a lot of academic stuff to take care of and the yeah. moment i started reading i could actually not put it down uh multiple reasons as a research student you're kind of trained to look at literature a certain way 
Right. And right. you read literature and you also read journalistic writing. Correct. And you Correct. read like theory and references and 50 other things. I feel like your book is everything in one. Because um, I'm a sucker for indexes. Like I like a really good sorted index to a book. And when Correct. I saw yours, there was the introduction. <laughs> there were the six tales. Uh-huh. Then there was notes. And then there were references. And also... The notes were not like, generally notes are like very meager for certain books. Right. But your notes were so detailed. I was sold at the first look. <laughs> and I think your introduction is one of the probably the best introductions I've read in 2020. Wow. Because wow. not a lot of people put thought in what to put as an introduction. And... <laughs> Like yours also locates you as a very, like in a very different place as an author with that introduction, which kind of makes sense for the tales to come. But how did White as Milk and Rice happen? Like, were you thinking about doing something like this for a long time? So, um, uh, let me uh, should I address the introduction bit first. Uh, the okay. reason, uh, reason why the introduction was very important for me was because this format, the format that I choose for this book that is literally non-fiction, um, can be complicated and it, it can bring up a lot of uh, questions in the minds of the readers. So, that's the reason I wanted my introduction to be very clear. Um, it, it, I wanted people to understand my journalistic methods, my, my style of working uh, uh, the reason I write this book and uh, the reason I want to want this book to be read and uh, be read by many many people so that that yeah. introduction was very important for me and I think I ended up spending about um, a, a few weeks if not um, more than a fortnight just finishing this introduction and uh, reworking it and working it so um, yes, that's, that's a bit about the introduction. And when it comes to uh, how did writer's milk and rice happen? Um, uh, honestly, I was in one of my uh, for one of my um, uh, column p- newspaper pieces. Um, I'm also a journalist, so for my one of my I think for one of my stories, I was in Bastar, and okay. I was in Bastar, and that's when um, at a journalist at a rally, I think I met Birsu. Birsu is one of my characters. From yeah, I absolutely love her. <laughs> oh, she, she was fascinating. So, um, uh, so uh, that's when I had met her. And the more, the I, I honestly wanted to know more about her. And uh, because she was the only woman in the entire rally who was oh. protesting against the minors. So that intrigued me and I ended up um, uh, taking down the name of her village. Mobiles don't work in that area because um, because because the, because of a lot of restrictions. So um, I ended up taking down the name of her village and when I visited her village, I couldn't find her. I do mention this in the introduction again. Yes, I read, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't find her and then I ended up finding her. When I was leaving, when I was going back to Narayanpur, I found her in the forest collecting firewood. And she was surprised looking at me because she said that uh, the reason I gave you my wrong name was because I did not expect to see you. Usually nobody comes as far. I ended up doing um, stories. Uh, I ended up staying for a week longer in Narayanpur. During the days, I would visit her in the nights. I would come down. I would make notes. Uh, then I did not know that this would turn into a book. But yeah. when I came back home, when I went back uh, and I started visiting the libraries, and I just out of intrigue, I wanted to know more about the tribe, and I wanted to know more. Um, I wanted to know the recent past, the past after the independence, and know what happened and how how things evolved and changed uh, for the tribe, and how did it affect the human relationships of these tribals with each other, with with uh, with mainstream society, uh, with uh, uh, you know how how has these how has these uh, string of changes and you know they've been very very quick and every every couple of uh, uh, years they they're seeing a massive change in the the way they eat the way they dress the way they uh, work uh, back then there was no a couple of years ago say a decade ago in their tribe no one was working they were just living on the forest goods and sometimes they would just go to the markets uh, closest to the village and sell their goods but 
uh but but uh, but i think 2 3 years ago they've started working they've started coming out started working in the mines so things have changed a lot and i was really intrigued and but what i ended up finding everywhere were um anthropological uh, anthropological studies and uh, you know lot of um, lot of academic work and yeah. the rest of the um, rest of the accounts that i found um, were honestly uh, you know they were they were pictures of their uh, culture pictures of their society overly decorated dance and song or just pictures of yeah. their condition for me the intrigue lay in the life that they'd been lead, leading post independence so that you know beside it although i was a non tribal and i was very very um uh, very about it i decided to pursue the subject nevertheless and probably, yeah, probably um, given outsider the subject so this is just like i'm not even kidding you like we we didn't really like know each other before i read the book but when i read the introduction i could literally hear every thing that you said in the last 7 minutes like i'm not even kidding you this is exactly how i imagined you talking about your book when i read the introduction which makes it even stronger oh, wow. because wow. when i read your story yeah. about how you followed this so i was like hey listen this is something that is not done and usually i am like since i've been for the last one or year i've been actively reading non white literature because i'm just so tired reading the same narratives so sure. i've been going out of my way to realize okay what what is marginalized mean and right. over time you realize that it's such a problematic tag you just stick to everything mm-hmm. so when i read when i found out that there's a book about the tribes mm-hmm. i was a little worried initially picking it up because i was like hey a lot is going on in the representation politics space right. but when i read the introduction it clearly said that i'm acutely aware of my position as a non tribal right and this is like yeah. what passing the mic means like you have the privilege and you take it We have a very interesting why things not? that I also. I'm sorry, I cut you. Why, why not? Why not? True. Um, and one of the most interesting things I found in one of your interviews, as well as while I was reading the book, is that as a writer, when uh, initially you planned the book, you actually were thinking of a narrator and the author and the stories of the six tribes. But then you removed yourself from the equation, which I think makes this book more like. balance between a literary non fiction uh-huh because uh-huh. generally there's a lot of anthropization of the idea of tribes and tribal right so right. when you were right. doing your research did you come across this general labeling of this quote and quote unknown that they think is undiscovered um honestly uh, all the the writing uh, most of their writings has been uh, anthropological but some of the writers who have uh, done these anthrop- these vast almost um, epic scale uh, sort uh, recording of their lifestyles and culture um, like Vera Elvin and um, uh, you know uh, Christopher uh, Christopher Van Furer so all these yeah. people, they have been uh, they have been brilliant with uh, you know the, the anecdotes that they provide in their books the the little examples the little stories the folk folk tales and the legends that they weave into it they are fascinating reads and absolutely enjoyable there's humor there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, a lot of small details which make uh, uh, make a body of work little more than anthropological piece of work but yeah. but the problem is that all this dates back to a a century ago if not a couple oh. of years ago so uh, you know uh, this this that was a problem for me because what the recent works that i tried to get access to they were mostly in fact uh, i hardly i could hardly find any but the couple of newspaper clippings and a couple of books um uh, especially um, i mean there have been um, there's there's been work of there's been work of mahasweta devi and there is um, then you then you can come across a couple of other writers who have yeah. but these his pieces are so small and they hardly uh, dig deeper when it comes to taking notes on their culture you know um they're smaller tales they they are they're just a little whiff of the entire uh, broth that's simmering there so, so that's that's what in 
you know, I I I thought that there was a lacuna there that I needed to fill in, like that there was a gap which I which I had to address, and that's when I decided to come in. And when you talk about um, uh, liter- the, the genre itself, uh, the literary nonfiction, for me, um, I'm a big reader of um, the writers of lit- uh, literary nonfiction like Rishard Kaputinsky, and then you have uh, uh, Truman Capote, and then um, the Out of Africa writer uh, is Tag Dennison. So all these writers have been, I mean, the writing has been, fast. it's a genre that absolutely intrigues me. And I'm sure you must have Read, uh, read Rohini Mohan's uh, narrative on Sri Lanka. Even that, for that matter, and also I think perhaps William Dalimple also to a large extent. Yeah, yeah, he's also been writing in a similar way. So, uh, it, it's a genre that, that interests me a lot. It helps. Uh, what what it does is that it makes the characters heroes and not the narrator. And yeah. which which is it totally throws light. It makes the stories more human, you know, and that is, that that I think changes everything. Uh, a lot of times people say that this this part is completely invented, and you know, um, uh, how what is the difference between fiction and non-fiction? Then, you know, it's it, this is not like the work of Susan Sontag, where there's an easily recognizable division between the two. Uh, okay. It, it it it's about what in fact there's hardly I I personally feel there's a distinction between fiction and nonfiction is less about did it really happen or were the writers narratives weaved in through or and it's more about the form it's about the expectations that are brought to certain forms you know according to how a book yeah. is presented packaged identified readers have certain expectations um. So, you know, sometimes people can find it quite disconcerting when a book isn't doing what they think it was meant to be doing. But at the same time, I feel it's, it can be completely fascinating to uh, when, when a book does not conform to certain set of expectations. And what you get instead is a, a completely um, a richer view of what yeah. you know, if it was just a, you know, documentary. I'm beyond amused because I've met very few people who talk so passionately about literary nonfiction because you know as a genre it lies in a space between fiction and literary fiction and oh, somewhere okay. in this entire chaos caused by popular fiction it is not something that you immediately pick i think one of the things i might ask you to do after the recording is just recommend a few books all of us could read to kind of understand literary fiction better because yes, i i remember you made a reference to truman in a in another context as well but another very very beautiful mm-hmm. uh, thing i noticed about the stories you tell right is that right. they don't happen in a vacuum like you are not picking up even when when you're trying to kind of uh, follow a character into a story into a tribe right. you are literally actually following them like you are not taking them out of the situation and placing them somewhere else in isolation and then dealing with them like right. the environment is very central to your text so right very made the wind very, blows yeah. and and the, the, the bit about the nilgiris and when i read uh, the strong wind of the nilgiris i was like hey this is actually how it works and I was beyond amused. Like my entire reaction to your book was just bits and pieces of, "Hey, I love this," and I don't know how else would I quote it because right. honestly, right. it is not voyeuristic, which is uh, which is what a lot of you know, for example, how white people write about, say, people of color. Mm-hmm. You see a lot of this this fetishization of the idea, even the, even the understanding of the word tribal, right. and then you come with such a fresh. narrative i even like the story behind naming the book white as milk and rice because yeah um, it's it's beautiful and i really want people to read it for them to figure out how did it come about okay. and okay. which one like do you have a bias which one was your favorite story like which journey was the one you enjoyed the most um it's like really easy it's so hard to do that but then um i think uh, for me the intrigue sometimes lies in the the person that i'm my interviewee the person i'm dealing yeah. with and for me um the story of uh, money who's the who's a kurumba tribal uh, for yeah. me, it's, it's it's extremely fact the, the reason um i'm attached to that story is also because um 
I I end up staying for about two or three weeks or probably more, and then I I also made a few later visits to visit Money, and um, who by the way, which is not the real name, he he preferred not being named, but okay. He, and i grew very attached he's a young boy he's probably in his early 20s you know um uh, uh, very verbose um talks a lot chatty uh, we were speaking most you know, of the time we were speaking through the translator but then he's also learned a, um, a little bit of english and um uh, uh, he he is still a part of a part of a rebel group and um, they they do stay in the hostel and um, so uh, you know he's he's picked up a lot of english too so we were okay. very chatty in their times i would drink their local liqueur with them and he would talk more than <laughs> what he thought <laughs> being documented so you know that those were the times when i would feel um am i am i uh, being voyeuristic here am i uh, probably intruding in their private space um and um honestly i i did have a couple of sleepless nights about this because uh, you know but 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 for honestly i wanted my readers to experience what i was experiencing and yeah. i changed his name and that's the reason i couldn't i wish i could uh, you know do justice by not naming him i wish i could um, uh, unfortunately they'll always be unnamed in the history of uh of the tribals but you know these beautiful characters uh, the, the only way i could get their story across uh, was by not naming them and yeah i get, get, i guess like um uh, I, I, the readers should the readers did need to know the what was happening and how how what how what were their daily lives like how what is the texture of their texture life of them. through the day through the nights what are the uh, traumas that affect them what gives them joy what is their environment like how does it affect the character the environment at every point in every story has um, sort of seeped into the the character of the person um and uh, this has happened like I, this is by uh, this has been my observation in all the six stories that it was impossible to take the environment out of their characters uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. the the conjures because they lived in such um, harsh such a uh, such a uh, with strong sun and like you know that that sort of that's burned their skin and um, it has made them a little more desperate like they they're very careful about the way they preserve their food and they're so they holding on to things because they're so hard to get at the same time when you look at um, you know people like halaki who live in the in the interiors of the forest and they so they they so large hearted they're so good with to their guests they they're so welcoming because they have so much to give there's so much there's so it's it's also abundant and yeah. uh, they never worried about falling short of resources because they know it's 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 just a right to forest away so yeah i guess like i did want to know and i did and when when they when they say uh, you know that uh, this this whole question about voyeurism authors are honestly great voyeurs and it's important <laughs> <laughs> come i mean i remember this um, the story of this writer i think it's he's some gerald foos if i'm not wrong um he actually rigged up his motel so that he could watch his guests going at it and um, wow and he and he kept an exhaustive journal of his observations and um, i i don't know how morally right he is, but i guess um for you know to to become an observer you need content right you need to dig in yeah. i guess as long as you're not um, causing harm to the uh, the person who you're interviewing why not why why should why should they <laughs> not be heard by others when honestly um authors are great warriors is something that i would put on a t-shirt and wear it everywhere <laughs> like every third favorite narrative of mine has come from a sort of a place where they're borderline warrioristic but that's what makes it richer like right. it's it's a, it's a very weird moral mix sometimes um, but you got to do what you got to do yes absolutely absolutely <laughs> okay another um very probably a very difficult thing for me to like if i ever imagine writing a book 
I would probably choose comfort. Like I would probably choose like a very Virginia Woolf style of a room of one's own, have yeah. a desk, have internet connection, and and everything snazzy, and then think of a narrative. But you literally went down to every single places and followed these people, spoke to them, lived with them, understood what exactly is happening. Uh, and one of the very interesting things that you say about the translators is not something that all the authors come out with. Talking about the other side of a fallacy of translation, how translation can also trick you and misguide you in. like pursuits like these yeah. um but a lot of what we understand as culture from isolated tribes exists in like oral culture uh-huh. and there's even if there's a script that is not something like say the urban audience can understand or belong in right so what was your uh, probably the biggest challenge converting orator to literature like is there a process that you followed ritualistically to do that um i guess like you know uh, some in some cases it was easier because there was a lot of um, data available like there were there was there was academic work done on them before like in case of um, like in case of the the maria community or in, in the, uh, the cognac community you know i there was a lot of primary data which i could cross check with and which i could um, make sure that factually i was right and you know at least the timeline was right but then um but honestly with the cup, the other community yeah. um the in the process of interview was not without pitfalls i know a lot was lost in translation and or the interlocutors um, often hid details because they were ashamed or they didn't think it mattered to the outsider and um, you know there were also there were also times when there were incidents and emotion that they aggressively chose to forget um or they purposely reframed so that they could just move on with their lives or just to outline their lives once again you know on their own terms but um but i guess uh, you know the entire um, uh, what what i ended up doing was uh, you, you know making notes of their little folk tales their legends their um, the stories uh, i had long chats with the interviewers interviewees you know it, it took a long there was a lot of mutual mistrust that we had to negotiate first and once okay. you know because because uh, they half of them were rebels some of them were forest dwellers so for them like conversing uh, to a urban uh, and how much ever i tried how much ever um, how, how much ever i tried to dress down or look um, look like a part of them i was not and yeah. this challenge was the language of course so um i guess once we once we once we overcome all those uh, blocks um once it it was easy you know because these are ultimately simple people who uh, and once they start opening up they they don't seem to stop you know they don't hold back too much so um it was nice and you know how the the whole idea of um, sex and its terms and its terminology yeah. is a taboo for us this is more of an urban issue than a than than these than than what these tribals face for them these terms are very general and everyday part of their lives for example the halakis um the halaki women from india yeah. a lot of their songs have used the uh, use breasts and sex and um, and you know uh, luring men um, it, it's a, it's a uh, it's a regular um, part of their repertoire and at the same time for the maria tribe you know tribe. sexual positions and trying out different methods to attract boys in the ghotul um, yeah. to marriage where they practice sex that is and um, all these things are just everyday parts of their life and it's it's mundane and it's it's just ordinary it's, it's nothing um, nothing that can raise eyebrows or you know so to a reader it might sound like who oh, why how how did this uh, character reveal so much to this writer how how did the writer yeah like again let's come back to the point of voyeurism for them it was not voyeurism for them right. you know, this was routine life and i was just yeah i guess to an urban dweller it this might seem like a little more than that it's it's really intriguing because uh, while i was reading the book i realized that there are so many things um that we now call as a capital c culture that we are actually doing to just discipline the idea of people 
right. because so much of it exists uh, because i had read the introduction very like i am somebody who spends more time on introductions in books than you know so much attention in reading the rest of the narrative like i am right. very focused like pencil level focused right. and i realized that most of it is narratives people came to you and told you right. and then i read on and i realized that a lot of things that we think are like just like you said are taboo or are something that you know the urban society would not recommend right. exists and also at the same time so many of their values are like shared values because right. i read about one of the tribes how they go out for hunting and whatever they make they bring it back and if there is like a wedding in the village or if something major is happening in someone's house they give it away Wow. as opposed to today when we are living in times where um you know resources are sparse mm-hmm. but our needs mm-hmm. are beyond that and mm-hmm. you see fights at grocery stores and queues that go on for an hour and a half but we yeah. don't have the idea of sharing of a community like uh, a certain yeah. communities that have been living in isolation do right that being right. said um this is not your first book right so right. Right. the first book that you wrote also follows 12 individuals and their professions right um, you wrote about the lost professions yeah. and yeah. i think like um, you know it's it's a very brilliant approach but i'm so curious like is there an intended reason why you choose people over communities to kind of trace and navigate around this literary space um honestly this, uh like this is a this is a you know when i started out with my second book i did not intend it to be um about the individual mm-hmm. i was looking at uh, you know creating an account of uh, the recent times of these tribals and i had picked a couple yeah. of them but you know as i started in fact somewhere in the middle of the book i realized that i'm not able to uh, uh, i'm not able to emote to my readers i am not able to tell uh, the story like the the uh, the everyday lives and the pain and the sorrows and the joys and the happiness and you know how they get affected by the environment i am not able to communicate it so i wanted that's the reason i decided to bring the individual in um, they mean in fact a couple of stories may not just have one person there are a couple of people you know there might be say <laughs> cognac story of okay. a father and a great grandson then in the um, in the halaki story there's sukri there's a daughter in law there's a son there are friends so um what i decided was that i'll just use these bunch of people and try to um, uh, bring out uh, bring out the uh, the, uh, the 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 challenge uh, the community faces in these um, everyday lives but you know these stories i i of course do not um, in, intend to say or not do i not am i claiming anywhere that these stories of these individuals are representative of the entire tribe they are <laughs> some total of their individual lives at the same time are you getting it so yeah. in every village and uh, every household and even individuals so the details are yeah. there um again i'm going to give an introduction that when the khasi sisters that i write about the khasi sisters have refused to convert to christianity whereas the rest of the community most of them are christian converts 80% of them are christian converts converts about 80% uh, okay uh, the kanji gangster, yes. gangster who i document he uh, he has surrendered to the police but then a lot of them are still um, practicing truck cutting or looting trucks Uh, in kind yeah. of violence then you have the kurumba boy this kurumba boy most of the kurumba boys uh, are now go to school but this specific kurumba boy is preferred taking up arms um unlike most of his peers so yeah um um i'm what becomes i think it just this tale just becomes okay. you know, when it's about the person and you know it's easier for uh, for um, for the for the society for a society like us to understand where they come from when you understand you know i'm i'm just following these people through their day and through the past few years of their lives it just becomes a richer story at the end it most definitely does because um another like like i mentioned in the beginning as well that the notes that i read yeah. uh were one of my most like it's, it's something that i can't wait to get a physical copy once the lockdown is over mm-hmm. but like i will most definitely bookmark those 25 odd pages and be like hey if anybody ever wants to write a book 
Yeah. This is how you do it because that is like chapter wise bibliography, chapter wise notes. So at one moment, it for me it also becomes like a research guide that I was reading. Like how do you go about conducting literary research in the non conventional sense? Right. Um, okay. One of the things I want to know from you as a writer, because you experimented with two different identities, like you, you kind of have a tension to chase what people tend to overlook. Right. As a writer, when somebody is beginning um, in this entire literary space, and maybe with literary fiction, are there certain things that you need to be aware of? And in extension to that question, um, the thing that I spoke about earlier about how you removed yourself from the equation. Are there certain markers that tell you that hey, this is the time to step back? Like, how does that awareness come about? Um, honestly, Lakshmi, it's it's what I was um what I was wary of. I was writing like again. I said like in my first book, the narrator is a part of the stories. You yeah. know, I am a part of these. I I I am witnessing the scenes. I am talking to the people, so I am there. But then, uh, when it came to this book, I realized uh, because you know tribals come with their own um, uh, stereotypes, which have been imposed by them onto the by the society. So, um, uh, what when I was narrating as a narrator, I was probably bringing in a lot of biases. I was probably you know it was impossible to ask questions it was impossible to um uh, give my observations without um without showing making my bias sort of come through and um that was that's when i realized that you know um i need to pull myself out and uh, it, it wouldn't be fair to these people they should be allowed to tell their own tales which they've been on unfortunately been allowed to do very less um uh, the, the, it's unfortunate i have to use the term allow uh, but yeah. i i um, it, what i want is these characters to speak you know because these are very they come from very different cultures you know the culture that we are not used to understanding in mainland india perhaps you know because they, they these are forest people these are hill people these are uh, perhaps the khasis are still um, the khasi is still belong to the mainstream society in a large way but even they are so misunderstood and understood for example um most of the people i still chat with assume that khasis are khasi is a matriarchal society whereas it's just a matriarchal mm-hmm. society you know women may handle the finances of the family but unfortunately they do not have any control over the family or oh. so it, it it just sort of complicates the situation it complicates the existence i have had their women telling me that they rather not do this they rather leave this job to the men which this is something that rest of the india would probably very readily exchange but yeah. but they are happy to give this away so which was very surprising for me and um, and then then i realized that you know if i ask questions it's impossible to not sound or it's no it's impossible to not make these biases come through so it was important for their story to shine and that's when i pulled myself out that that was a very like sense because when i read that i was like, he, like a lot of the authors kind of force themselves into stories sometimes like you know that you could have been made to without them kind of guiding you through because some stories are so rich by themselves True. that you could just you know but it's it's just like a very very um alerting moment to me because as somebody who's also trying to analyze how are people telling stories absolutely I'm con- i constantly have a have my radar ticking when it comes to how authors interact with certain stories how do characters interact with certain stories yeah. Yeah. and it takes a lot of courage to stand in a place and be like i am aware of where i come from and i am choosing to remove myself from the situation because it does more justice to the actual purpose of my work and that needs yeah. some another level of awareness and i'm really really glad that you have not only created a kind of a archive of six stories of six like the tray six individuals right but right. also created like a starting point for a lot of newer readers to kind of enter this discourse because even when um, 
I think I the last book I read about to try was the Adivasi. Uh, okay, wait, I'm forgetting the name of the book. The Adivasi will still not dance if I'm not wrong. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the last yeah, story yeah, collection yeah, I read. Yeah, yeah. And I realized that there is so much that yeah, the Adivasi will not dance by uh, Hansda Shekhar. If I'm not wrong, the yeah, dear friend. Yes, he has given a, a recommendation. I read that, and it is so beautiful. Even you got Benjamin to write, and like honestly, I was sold on the first page, like to begin with. And just then I realized, okay, there are so many selling points that one podcast episode cannot probably cover all the aspects, but. Right. That being said, I I realize how important your role here is to kind of tell the new age reader that hey, listen, this is another way of telling stories mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. trying to write a story mm-hmm. by always passing the mic, knowing and understanding where you come from, what is your privilege, and then passing the mic for a character to speak up about their realities as opposed to a narrator trying to chalk out how it feels to live. you know a certain kind of a life mm-hmm. and it's really really commendable <laughs> thank you and that reminds me that you are going to read us a excerpt but just before that i think we should go for a short break and come back right see you see you soon yeah entertainment is like food for the brain it's a window to culture and a great way to understand the world around us The internet has changed what it means to be an entertainer, creating new storytellers with millions of fans. It has spawned a new breed, the story sellers, those behind the scenes creating the business for this ecosystem. They work with brands, platforms and channels who are keen to capitalize on an audience hungrier than ever for more stories. I am Vineet Kanabar and I have a ringside view to how stories are told and sold. On my show, I bring you creators, artists, executives and marketers for a freewheeling conversation around the business of entertainment. Tune in to Storytellers and Story Sellers for personal stories, analysis and criticism every Thursday as I talk to the brightest minds telling or selling great stories today. When his father's snores get louder, money quietly slips out of the hut, barefoot. It's almost dawn. He walks out to the edge of the hill where he can see the Nilgiris, the blue mountains. They are the bluest when he lies down on his head and looks through the green that grows by his cheek. He watches a yellow butterfly perch on a blade of grass that bends under its weight. His birth mother would often bring him here. She'd weave cane baskets while he painted on rocks with a piece of cloth and paints made from soil and bark of trees. His hands, Mani's hands, were like a magician's, making intricate figurines dancing around a tree full of beehives, or another of sticks of men in white lungis playing drums hanging from their necks. Mani's mother, Mani's mother's love for him was odd. She'd often stare at him and smile sadly. "Will you go to school, Mani?" she'd asked him a year ago. "What do they do in school?" "You learn about rivers, forests, and mountains." But that I already know, Aji. A mountain turns purple with kuringi flowers once in twelve years. If you break a bone, make a new carded deer antler in the forest and have it with pepper. The river that that is all good money. But when you go to school, you can get a job. With a job, you can buy a bicycle and eat chicken. Okay, Aji. I will go to school and learn a job. The day his uncle, his mother's brother, had picked him up from the first day at school in a nearby town, Money walked out sulking. He decided he wouldn't go to school again. She made me sit in the back of the classroom unlike the Badaga boys. He complained to his uncle about the teacher. In the interval, I asked her when I would be taught a job. She slapped me. Your mother is poor, his uncle said, as if he'd not heard anything else. She may die. Money was quiet for the rest of the long walk back to their hamlet. She may die, but she only had a stomach ache. Don't kurumbas die when they get old or their bodies full of blisters? For everything else, there were spells and forest medicines. As he walked back from school that day, Money played a secret game with his fingers that children in Hulikal play. 
If he sang a song and it ended on an odd finger, his mother would live. So he sang a song and it ended on his odd finger. Pleased, he tried again. This time it ended on an even finger. He tried many times and made sure he said one or two words a little slow so that it ended on odd fingers. The next day, they buried his mother. His father remarried a girl half his age, within a month of his mother's death. While they exchanged betel leaves and areca nuts as a part of their marriage rituals, Mani sat there in his favorite spot in the hills. It is dawn by the time he walks back downhill to his village, a collection of seven or eight huts with no approach road. Bindu, his stepmother, waits for him outside the hut. She's small, thin, and like all Kurumba women in the hamlet, her sari is tied in a knot over her bosom. Where were you? Your food is ready. Her silky voice hypnotizes money. A strange feeling shoots from his stomach when her hands stroke his head. He has seen dogs doze off and someone barely strokes their head like this. He pictured himself trusting her like his father did last night. What if his father knew what he was thinking? As his stepmother pours him on to eat more, Mupan sits outside under a broken solar light, drunk before the sun has set. A short, dark-skinned man with the same mop of head over his, over his head as his son. A wide nose and deep yellow eyes like that of every Kurumba in Hulikul. This, okay, uh, there was a very fun, okay, um, let me take this from the start. Um, I love the Kurumba story, especially because in the introduction, you gave us a little insight as to why they call it Alu Kurumba, so I'm saying Alu, right? Mm-hmm. And the story behind why they choose that prefix to kind of change how they were perceived over the years. And then following money and his journey is just simply, simply amusing. Thank you so much. And that reading was just wonderful. I'm so glad. Thank you. I hope it sort of gives you a picture of what the rest of the book looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm most definitely urging everyone to go and read because I, I somewhere have a bias personally. I like reading. Um, like I've had enough of the mainstream authors for some reason. And I don't mean any harm when I say that. I do enjoy going back to them. But if you leave me in a bookstore today and ask me to pick out a few books for myself, I might just lean towards some women of color, some literature in translation, like Indian literature in translation, and most definitely narratives like these, something that I might not have read before. And literary fiction is something that I really, really wish I could explore more in the coming time. I'm sure, yeah. I am I'm, 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 I'm feeling that there are a lot of books coming out in this genre because this does seem to be um, tickling people's mind, you know, because it's it's richer. It's it's more than what a fiction or a non-fiction would offer to you. I think it's kind of, it's a, like I'm literally stealing a quote from Miley Cyrus, but it's like best of both worlds right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, that being said, um, you've been on both the sides. You've been on the best of one side of the world as a journalist and the other as an author and you go to a lot of lit fests and you're there on a lot of panels and this is something that I want to do with a lot of authors because my homework around like my research around an episode relies a lot on what has already been spoken like I follow very um, like I reduce down to my questions I kind of try to remove things that have already been asked so what are the questions that someone has asked you the most Ah, uh, the question that someone has asked me the most. Um, I think one of the question that um everybody seems to be asking is um why these six tribes? Why okay. are there other tribes of in, in India? India has a massive tribal population, and there there's so many different kinds of tribes. But why these six? And um, uh, my answer to that usually is that. You know, there were a couple of these are the tribes which intrigued me the most at the outset. Um, number one, number two, um, geographically speaking, they were slightly easier to reach compared to the other tribes, or in some cases, they were more challenging than the other tribes. So that's where the intrigue lay. And um, most importantly, the interviewees here were willing to open up, uh, or the conversations with them were richer. Then compared to the the tribes or in some cases the translators were better so the reasons are various but 
um i felt um, you know because this documenting these six tribes um uh you know sort of it it, it didn't it did not exist yeah. completely but um by the end of these six tribes i knew emotionally there was an upheaval so i i couldn't probably go on this way so for me okay. these six tribes were it like i knew that my book was done when these six tribes were done and also you are like a super woman redefined because you're oh, handling it and i'm so glad you could like if i was in your place i would have just locked myself up in a house after publishing the book because handling a toddler and an infant and doing the promotions around the book and then reaching out to people you think you can have great conversations with and then agreeing to reschedule and just make it happen over tech requires a lot of work and i'm so grateful okay. and just <laughs> i don't know how you pulled it out it is quite challenging oh, yeah. because um, it is perspective i leave home every morning you know my little girl is you know dancing out her objections around my knees the tod- the infant um i i finished lucky enough in my book before the infant came in but okay. uh, you know i don't know what would happen then but then you know when the little girl used to have her own objections i would pick her up and and you know tell her that you know i am a writer and, and i'll be happier and and i'll be a better mum when i write i uh, also for me it's a it's a daily hopscotch of mundane logistics you know i i have plenty of domestic help um i have there's there's organizing of play dates keeping track of vaccinations there's shopping cooking uh, shopping for food cooking and making rents build a trade a uh, lot of these these things you know thanks you i have an amazing um, partner who, um, who helps me navigate through this big mess uh, but at the same time i ha- i keep having this constant in you know, a argument um here am i might asking uh, you know talking to myself and saying like let's just take a few years off live simple you know just enjoy the incandescent human being that is there before you the small girl but then there am i telling telling myself again that i cannot you know um these are uh, my the, the, the child in me the writer child in me uh needs my attention too <laughs> honestly it's very exhausting to be to me me so <laughs> it and also the the kind of offbeat choices that you've made because you know like with all of this you could have chosen to like like i spoke about the snazzy desk before if i was ever an author right and you know, i guess you always get asked about your routine how do you practice your writing and what is your process what is right. your desk right. like i mean you literally step down and you you went to these places that you wanted to talk about you know that the nilgiri winds are strong because you experienced them and because you were present and making a choice is uh, my daughter was reading when i was traveling for the book uh, except okay. probably nagaland and uh, i think in no other place at the other places she was traveling with me like she was staying with me in those hamlets she was yeah we were together in this yeah. <laughs> that is so like i want to say cute but also so brave because oh. the kind of honestly maybe half of it just comes from the kind of image that is being created about these spaces in the mainstream narrative as something that you need to avoid something that you need to uh, keep yourself safe from but behind that lies so many narratives that need to be spoken about that being said i feel like your book is like a re- like a ready reckoner like a reference point for anybody who wants to say do research in this space figure out how to write better um figure out how to write these narratives better and not kind of fetishize the idea of tribal just because you know you choose to read less because it has mm-hmm. everything like it has your notes in place it has your references in place mm-hmm. where do you think like i i kind of look at this as a different kind of a starting point like a 21st century starting point to write and talk more about literatures that are of spaces that are not explored often what is the ideal future that you see for literary fiction and for narratives like these 
um uh, she <laughs> was treated this way you know like uh, with, with, with my little kid and with my second one um, most of the time when i was writing this book i was pregnant you know so um uh, this 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 last the last few years have been like a desperate desperate race um i have worked until we are in the morning and you know there are times when i have th- thought that maybe i'll die like this is terrible like i'll have a heart attack or something i wrote a lot of stuff that was no good and um, most of the times i was writing uh, when the kid when the girl was sleeping and i had nothing to do and it was it was it was really tough so there were times but there were also times when i wish that i had digged in deeper you know i had um, created there was so much more to be explored with each of these tribes there was so much more i could do uh, these were just a couple of thousand words that i had written i could probably go on like each tribe could be a book each tribe could be a novel uh but i guess um, you know there are different stages in a writer's life and uh, you could call this my starting point too <laughs> this is where i am beginning this is where i am i am not a trained anthropologist nor am i a trained um, so uh, i have not i'm not trained in sociology nor am i trained in psychology nor am i the only uh, studies that i have done is that of journalism so honestly i am learning as i am writing uh, you know uh, i'm burrowing my head into the subject and learning as as the reader is learning so this yeah. is class point 2 and i am uh, this is this is where i begin my journey and i really hope i can explore them and i can create richer and deeper you know every time i finish a book and send it to the editor it's after a very long debate with myself whether it's over or not i'm so glad they're dead i'm so glad that my editor is chasing me because <laughs> uh, I, I, for me, it's never enough. It's never, never, never enough. Although I've exhausted all sorts of research that is available on the specific subject, I've been to the library. I've spoken, spoken to the academician. I've spoken to students studying the subject. I am reading all kinds of books, literature, papers, scholarly work, newspaper articles, everything that is available on the subject. You know, that's 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 the way I uh, begin my work. But um, to finish it. It is. It's. 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 It's the biggest challenge because it's. It's. You know, you're talking about humans here, which are. But I guess um, these, my, this is what my personal limitation was. I do not want this to sound like an excuse, but I guess I had to draw a line somewhere and do justice to the other roles that I have um, in my life. So I guess um, there will a time will come when I can probably become a part of these marginalized societies and bring these. marginalized people uh, you know closer and closer to um, the center that that is very apt because for anyone who is exploring this space and understanding how to write about like places that you don't originally come from but mm. can choose to kind of lend your privilege and build that bridge from where say people like the protagonists of your novel i would like to call them like that the protagonists of your uh, six stories could mm. actually come and share their own stories mm. i think that is required and that is not a very like that's not an impossible task i mean if you put in the kind of effort that say nidhi has put in in her work the the right. amount of reading that has gone into it it, it clearly shows when you write and yeah. it just requires a lot of courage to own up to understand where you personally stand and from there look at the world through a very different lens and i'm so mm. grateful you did that and i'm so grateful to have you on this episode because these are things i really really wanted to speak to an author about yeah i have yeah. spoken to authors and you know very honestly the three authors that have been here on the show have all been like we don't know what is the right point of giving away a book Like when do you book? A book is never complete. It is always a work in process. Mm-hmm. And even after we've sent it to our publishers, even after the first copies have come out, we still feel like we could have changed the thing here or there. Yeah. But I have an alternate definition to offer. A book is never complete, also because the readers kind of complete the process. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I read the book, and now I'm thinking about. and other things maybe i could read up about and maybe i would build a different link from there i think the book lies at the center of this 
brilliant network it builds around itself and it's the success lies in the fact that the network gets stronger and stronger as you go ahead yeah and for, i i guess in times like these i'm so glad for <clears throat> something like a podcast because you know talking about a book is so difficult there is no platform left like you know we don't have i do not have any launch i did not have any um talk about the book and that book came out a week before the lockdown and it was reached many people it could just reach a few handful uh, authors and reviewers so um i guess um you know these platforms become so important for us um as writers where we can talk more and uh, you know educate people about what we started out with what we intend to do um and i guess like yeah it gets it becomes easier to talk about the book in in these places and and i hope the word gets out <laughs> i'm so glad and i'm so glad to have you this has been a brilliant conversation and i i really feel grateful that authors and writers and publishing houses are also acknowledging the work individuals are putting in over time apart from the traditional review system to kind of dig deeper into the behind the tales and It's just it's just amazing to listen to more stories behind the story. It just makes the process a lot richer. Thank you so much. Thank you. And quickly before we log out, if you could tell us where we can find you on the internet, what are your socials, where do we follow you for more of your work? Yes, absolutely. Uh, please please uh, do follow my Instagram handle, which is uh, Nidhi Kundalia. and uh, uh it this, this is where i do end up writing my heart out most of the times i find i'm more comfortable there um otherwise i do have my facebook um uh, a profile uh, and i do accept um, um stranger invites because most of the stuff i put there is impersonal and uh, but yeah instagram is where you can find me please do add me there and we can yeah. take a take the conversation further that is brilliant and you should most definitely get writers milk and rice if you can get it online please go for it um or the moment the lockdown is lifted you know where to head and what to buy so thank you so much nidhi for the wonderful reading and for the wonderful thank conversation so i'm so grateful thank you so thank much thank you so thank you for the time so. see you lakshmi thank you bye bye Are you looking for India's most awesome cricket podcast? Are you now tired of listening to the same old guys drone on about cricket everywhere? Edges and Sledges is a weekly cricket podcast hosted by three fans of the game, Varun, DJ, and myself, Ashwin. It was established in early 2018, has over 60 episodes now, and is of course now proud to be on the IVM Podcast Network. Each week, we get together from three different time zones: the USA, the UK, and Singapore, and we talk about things from the world of cricket with a focus on Indian cricket. We often interview special guests from all around the world, include, including former cricketers and cricket media personalities. So check out Edges and Sledges, the cricket podcast, now on the IVM Network.